<laughs> so our next speaker this morning is uh, Nigel Hitchin, so the one of the famous Hitchin vibration. <laughs> <laughs> Closely related to Ngobao Chao proof of the fundamental lemma. So, and he will speak about X bundle. Okay, X bundle is like a Ichin bundle, I think, the same. And uh, past and present. Okay. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to give this talk. Though, uh, given the audience, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to decide what to do, but... Uh, I thought I would give a mainly historical talk about how, how these objects arose uh, in the context of my own and other people's work. But, but first, uh, maybe let me put this uh, quotation up. I mean, I'm sure a number of you have seen this before. <laughs> but it seems to me that uh, Ngo Bao Chao is uh, just this kind of mathematician and just this kind of Frenchman uh, because... Uh, I thought I knew about an object which he uh, translated into his own language and certainly turned it into something completely different, which is an amazing thing. So, uh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to restrict myself to the things that I, I know about. Uh, and uh, really, it, it concerns these gauge theoretic differential equations. So I'm starting with a Riemann surface, and I have uh, a holomorphic vector bundle over it, with the Hermitian metric and uh, a holomorphic section of the endomorphism bundle twisted by the canonical bundle. So in uh, <coughs> Ngo's work, of course, he involves higher twistings, twistings with all sorts of line bundles. And indeed, uh, <coughs> this, uh, a lot of the features uh, are replicated here, but this particular uh, twist is important for the, for the differential geometry. And then what happens is that if you have a holomorphic vector bundle with a Hermitian metric, there is a natural connection. The connection has a curvature. And then we have these equations here, which relate the, uh, the Higgs field and the curvature. So what I want to do is to, is to <coughs> talk about these. Uh, so when I first uh, wrote a paper on these, uh, I called them the self-duality equations on a Riemann surface. And then when Carlos Simpson got involved in the work, he called them the Higgs bundle equations. But nowadays, as you've probably heard, they're called Hitchens equations. Now, I'd, I don't mind what they're called, and uh, I don't think this guy minds either, actually. So this is Peter Higgs. I'm sure you've seen his picture in the newspapers earlier, earlier this year. Yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> could be. <laughs> yeah, sure. He's happy about anything, I think, now. Okay, so let me, so I want to do this uh, in the historical sense, if you like, uh, and describe how these equations uh, arose, at least uh, from my point of view. So this goes back uh, uh, many years to, uh, to the study of, of instantons. So, so I'll try to be... Uh, uh, very basic in this. So this was a problem which came to differential geometers from physicists, and the problem was to find a, a connection on R4, so that means you're basically given uh, four functions with values in the Lie algebra, and this, I'm just going to consider the unitary group UN, so skew emission matrices. Uh, with these, you can define a, a derivative, a covariant derivative, differential operator for each direction. And then the commutator of these operators is the, uh, this is the curvature. And then the equations that uh, you're looking at are these, there are three equations uh, relating the components of the curvature. So that is, uh, you know, in naive uh, terms, that is, uh, that is what the equations that you're looking to solve are. And uh, in more invariant notation, uh, these are the anti-self dual Young Mills equations. And the problem there was to actually find solutions with uh, where the curvature was L2 on the whole of R4. Given one solution, a gauge transformation, that's you can change it by an automorphism, a unitary automorphism, uh, just by conjugating these operators. And uh, so the, the problem there was to, to classify such solutions uh, under gauge equivalence. And, uh, well, we managed by a mixture of methods, we managed to do this uh, to reduce the problem 
to a problem involving matrices, a set of matrices satisfying quadratic constraints. So that was, that was one, one story which, uh, which was, uh, uh, started me. Uh, really, it started me on this interaction between uh, mathematics and physics, really. So then, uh, a few years later, I got involved in another set of equations, uh, equations for magnetic monopoles. So these were equations uh, on R3 for a connection and an extra field called a Higgs field. So this is the first time that, uh, in my writing, I used the, the term Higgs field. Uh, and so in this case, you, you get the, the curvature. So you just have these three uh, AIs. You have three uh, covariant derivatives. The curvature has three components. And you, uh, you have uh, analogous equations, three equations here, which relate the, the derivative of phi, the covariant derivative of phi, to the, com the components of the curvature. So these... Uh, these are like the non-abelian versions of uh, the equations uh, grad phi equals curl of A, if you like, in, in just potential theory. And there, uh, so those are equations. So here, I mean, you probably noticed that they're very similar to the uh, anti self julian mills equations. And indeed, uh, if you look at uh, solutions to self -Julian, anti self julian mills which are invariant under translation in the fourth direction, then basically this, uh, this fourth component of the connection is, becomes the Higgs field downstairs. Uh, but in any case, the, uh, the equations may be special cases of the anti self julian mills but the boundary conditions in three dimensions are not. So here you want some finite action uh, uh, which involves the curvature and the covariant derivative of the Higgs field. So, well, in this case, of course, the covariant derivative is related to the curvature, so it's, it's actually the same. The L2 norm of the, of the curvature <coughs> should be uh, finite, but this is an integral over R3. So I looked at these from one point of view, and then uh, Werner Nam had a, another point of view. And uh, anyway, I, I wrote a paper about that, putting the two, the two things together. So I was interested in these gauge theoretic, equa theoretic equations in four dimensions, gauge theoretic equations in three dimensions. And then, uh, somewhat uh, later, um, Peter Goddard and Ed Corrigan wrote a paper where they kind of stood back and looked at the various constructions and uh, noticed, uh, uh, well, they didn't call it duality there. They had to think of a new name because that all, duality is used many times. In particular, Goddard wrote a paper about electromagnetic duality. So here they called it reciprocity. Uh, so this was the observation that the, uh, the four-dimensional problem of instantons was solvable by matrices, that is something in zero dimensions, that Norm's <coughs> solution to the monopole equations, which are defined in three dimensions, reduced it to a system of ordinary differential equations, one dimensions. So it got me thinking that there was some uh, relationship. One must go down to two dimensions, there must be something interesting to be said. And at the time, I was thinking that maybe there's some kind of relationship between uh, 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 some kind of involution going from two dimensions to two dimensions, which generalized that. Well, so this was in, uh, what, I don't know, 1984 or so. But uh, so I began to look at the, the two-dimensional reductions of uh, the anti self dual young mills equations. But as, as is typical in this, in this area, you know, when, when you get an, an idea, you, know, you usually find that the physicists have thought of it first. And so, in fact, only recently I decided, when preparing this talk, I decided to have a look through the literature and see whether these equations that I, I wrote up at the beginning had actually appeared in the, in the physics literature. And, in fact, I did find a, a paper. So this is back again in 1977 when people were trying to construct solutions to the instanton equations. And uh, Lohr, well, I don't know, anyway, he, in, as part of his, uh, his paper, he actually wrote down these two-dimensional reductions. Okay, well, I'll write them down in another, another form in a minute. But as you see, he uh, dismissed them completely because he says, in this case, the model is not interesting because the action is always zero. So what that means is that if you actually look for solutions to these equations where the... Uh, 
norm squared of f plus the norm squared of d psi plus norm squared of d phi is finite, then there aren't any solutions. So in R4, we have these instantons. In R3, we have these monopoles. The, the two-dimensional equations uh, had no finite action solutions, and so he dismissed, dismissed it. So, so this is where, uh, so these are the, this is the equations, okay? So you start with a, this is uh, effectively the equations he wrote down in slightly different notation. You now have a connection in two dimensions, A1 and A2. You now have two Higgs fields, phi1 and phi2, and the equations you write down look like this. So these are precisely the equations you get by taking anti-self dual Yang Mills and translating in the x3 and the x4 direction. So invariant in under translation in the x3 and the x4 directions. So, uh, so the, the, the point was that these have no, um, no interesting solutions. There are no really good boundary conditions in R2, uh, which are analogous to monopoles and instantons. And I think I heard that through uh, Peter Goddard, but uh, I never... I didn't really think about it very much. What, what, it seemed to me that uh, the interesting point was these last two equations because you could uh, rewrite them as uh, Cauchy-Riemann equations. So we know that uh, when you have a, a connection in, in two dimensions, when you have these covariant derivatives, then actually you can, uh, they define a holomorphic structure on the uh, a complex bundle. So that's... It's pretty easy to, to show that there are solutions that, so that nabla 1 plus i nabla 2 is actually a d-bar operator on, uh, in some sense, and that these, these uh, last two equations could be put together into one complex equation, which uh, is, is a Cauchy-Riemann equation. But then the last one, the last uh, part of the equation, says that uh, we have to equate a curvature with uh, a bracket of phi 1 and phi 2, and in order to make that uh, uh, geometric, curvature is a two-form, so this, uh, this uh, bracket of the phi 1 and phi 2 had to be make, made into a two-form, which meant that phi had to be a one-form. So you have to put this, this term in. And once you do that, once you write the same equations on R2 in this form, then, then you see that actually this makes conformally invariant sense, and so you can define them on any Riemann surface. So these, these obvious boundary conditions on R2, which have no solutions, uh, can be uh, <coughs> dispensed with, and instead you can start looking at solutions to these on a, on a Riemann surface, a compact Riemann surface. So that was the, the obvious uh, thing to do, because a compact Riemann surface, the analysis is, is much better behaved in any case, and, uh, and there were well-defined uh, methods of approaching gauge theoretic problems. So, um, but one thing that happened here when, as I was beginning to look at these, and that was I kept making sign errors. And uh, so there's some very similar equations where you put a minus there instead of a plus. And the minus equation um, relates to something equally geometric. It relates to harmonic maps from the surface into, into a group. So when you're studying minimal surfaces or surfaces of constant mean curvature in three space, the Gauss map is harmonic. There's a whole lot of literature going back to the you know, 19th century about special properties of these solutions. And uh, so for, for some time, I, I made this confusion, and I, I started going down the road of uh, harmonic maps. But, uh, but <coughs> I kind of realized uh, the, the setting of these equations much better when uh, in 1983, I went to... Uh, Stony Brook, and I, I learned from the physicists there, from Martin Rocek in particular, about the what's called the hypercalar quotient construction. So uh, let me uh, let me try and explain. Uh, so this is something to do with quaternions. So this is uh, this is a, a cleaned up version of the plaque on uh, on the bridge in Dublin, where Hamilton uh, wrote wrote his uh, scratch these formula: I squared is J squared is K squared. Ijk is equal to minus one. Last time I visited it, it was covered with spray paint. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's what it says. Um, so the point is that the quaternions somehow lie 
behind the structure of these, these equations. Uh, so let me just, you know, as an example, let me just put it this way. That suppose I'm in four dimensions and I write down this operator here with quaternionic coefficients, i, j, and k. Now I look at its uh, formal adjoint. Then the statement that this is, uh, so the d star d in general is, a, is like a quaternionic second order operator, but it's, it's real if and only if these uh, anti-self dual Yang Mills equations are satisfied. So there's clearly some relationship between quaternions and the equations that, uh, that I was looking at. So let me, let me try and, uh, let me just define now what a, a hyperkähler manifold is. So here, this is, this is a question of a Kähler manifold. So Kähler manifolds are very plentiful. You can just take any projective variety uh, sit inside projective space that from the standard metric on projective space that has a, a Kähler metric. But a Kähler metric is, is, is a comp on a manifold, is, so this is a complex manifold. So the tangent uh, space is a complex vector space. It has the operation of I. I squared uh, is minus one, but you have a metric as well, a Riemannian metric, which is compatible with the complex structure. And you have a two form. So this is now, so G is symmetric, but when you throw in the I, I is skew symmetric, so this gives you a, a two form. And to say that this is a Kähler metric is to say that the, uh, the exterior derivative of that two form is zero. So a hyper Kähler metric is, uh, is what, what the name says. It's, it's a Kähler in many different ways. So you have a manifold where the, so now you can't define local quaternionic coordinates, that's, that's the wrong idea. But instead, you have uh, the operation of the quaternions on each tangent space. So each tangent space is a, a module over the quaternions, quaternionic vector space. And uh, you have a metric which is uh, compatible with i, j, and k in the sense that it's a mission with respect to i, j, and k. This gives you uh, two forms. You have omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3. These are two forms. And uh, the hyperkähler condition is that if each of these is, is actually closed. So it's a, it's a Kähler manifold in lots of different ways. And uh, this is what, uh, what makes these uh, more interesting than ordinary Kähler manifolds, because in fact, uh, there are some complicated nonlinear differential equations which, uh, which are, you require to, to solve. For example, in, in two complex dimensions, uh, this is the same thing as a kolabi yau metric, and, uh, and in order to prove existence of a kolabi yau metric on, say, a K3 surface, you need... Yao's famous proof of the, of the Kalabi conjecture. So uh, finding hyper Kähler manifolds is, is much more difficult than finding Kähler manifolds. So, uh, so when I heard that uh, physicists like uh, Rocek had a, a method of constructing hyper Kähler manifolds, uh, I, I was very interested in that. And, uh, and so I, I, uh, when, I visited, when I was uh, spending a year at Stony Brook, I, uh, I learned a lot about it, and we, we wrote a paper. So let me just describe the, uh, the method of... So it's all based, this construction is based on what's called symplectic reduction. So here we have, I mean, the point is that on a hyper manifold, you have these three closed two forms, which are not each non-degenerate. And, uh, uh, but if you look at one of them, then uh, you, what you get is a, is a symplectic manifold. So... Symplectic manifold here is a manifold with a, a closed two form, which is non-degenerate. And the reduction process is, is that if you have a, a group action which preserves this two form, then uh, an element in the Lie algebra of the group gives you a vector field on the manifold. If the group preserves uh, omega, then the Lie derivative of omega vanishes. And then it's, uh, then locally, just a bit of differential geometry shows you that there's a, there's a function uh, called the moment map and uh, the right global conditions that exists as an, an equivariant uh, moment map. So, so you get a, a function mu for each element in the Lie algebra. That's the same thing as a map from the manifold to the dual of the Lie algebra. And then the reduction process says that under the right conditions, if you look at the inverse image of zero, 
and then take the quotient by the group G, then you get a new symplectic manifold. So that was a, uh, that's a well-defined process in symplectic geometry. And uh, so the hyperkähler quotient construction is basically you do it uh, for each of these uh, three two forms. So now for each element in the Lie algebra, you get three moment maps. Uh, this gives you a map from the manifold into the, the dual of the Lie algebra, tensor R3, or if you like, the imaginary quaternions, you could think of that. And then the theorem is that this is, this is hyperkähler. So it's, uh, it's a means, now, you might say, why, why does this produce you interesting hyperkähler manifolds? And you only have to take some simple examples of a flat space, so just flat quaternionic vector space, and choose the right group action, and you find that these are non-trivial uh, hyperkähler quotients. So that was, that was what I learned uh, by talking to uh, physicists, and we wrote up somewhat later. Uh, somewhat later because we tried to put it all in the same language, but in the end, uh, you can see where to, where to cut. Um, so, okay, so that's, but that is a kind of finite dimensional situation. But more or less at the same time, there are a lot of uh, applications of the uh, reduction process, the symplectic reduction, in infinite dimensions. So this was, this was initiated, I think, really by Atiyah and Bott as they were studying uh, flat connections on, uh, on, on a surface uh, and its relationship to the, uh, to the theorem of Narasimhan and Sashadri. So, so they, they used uh, symplectic methods in this setting. So, so now here you have a, a compact Riemann surface and now you fix some uh, bundle, principle UN bundle. So it, may, it could be trivial. It could be C infinity trivial, if you like. And then you look at the space of all C infinity connections on this. So a connection is a, as I said before, it's a, it's a differential operator. But the, the point is that the, the leading term has this d by dxi, and the, the difference of any two is actually a, a tensorial object. So it's really a, a one form, a differential one form with values in the, uh, the Lie algebra. So this is a, an infinite dimensional flat affine space. And if you're on a Riemann surface, then you have a, a complex structure uh, on the one forms, so on the tangent space and the cotangent space, and so that gives you a complex structure on this flat affine space. But it's also a, a, a Kähler uh, a flat Kähler manifold because you have, so A dot is here, uh, something in here, B dot is something in here, they take the wedge product and take the trace, or let's say the killing form over the, the, the Lie group, and you integrate, and that gives you, formally speaking, a, uh, a flat Kähler structure on this affine space. So that, that doesn't tell you anything, but... Uh, on the other hand, there's a group acting on this space, which is the, an infinite dimensional group, the group of gauge transformations, and it acts on connections by conjugation. And so you can ask, well, it, it preserves the symplectic form, so you can ask, what is its moment map? So, in this, so this, is, this is formal, of course, but, uh, but you can, uh, I mean, when it comes to the last point, you can certainly make it rigorous using Banach space implicit function theorem. So formally speaking, uh, what is the Lie algebra of the group of gauge transformations? So these are maps. G is maps from the surface into the group. Uh, so the Lie algebra is basically maps from the surface into the Lie algebra. The dual, well, in this, in this situation, by duality, you have to take the trace and integrate. And so you have to have two forms with values in the Lie algebra. And then they pointed out that, formally speaking, the, the moment map for this action was the, the curvature. So the curvature of a connection is a two-form with values in the Lie algebra. That is uh, how you interpret the dual of the Lie algebra of the group of gauge transformations. So then what is the, uh, the reduced space? What is the symplectic quotient here? It's the inverse image of zero, so it's a set of uh, flat connections, curvature zero, modulo equivalence, modulo gauge transformation. So this is a, a finite dimensional space, finite dimensional symplectic space we now see because it's symplectic reduction. 
which is obtained from an infinite dimensional uh, point of view. And as I say, you need some uh, but relatively simple analysis to, to justify, uh, justify this. So that's what uh, Atiyah and Bott uh, had done. Um, and uh, it fitted in very well with uh, the, uh, the known results of Narasimhan's Shadri that a stable uh, vector bundle had a canonical flat connection because when you have a complex structure on the surface, uh, this space of connections can be thought of as a, a complex vector space, a complex affine space. It's a space of D-bar operators, the space of holomorphic structures on this underlying C infinity bundle. And then the quotient becomes uh, not just a, a symplectic manifold, but it becomes a complex manifold. Uh, which is identified with the moduli space of stable bundles. So, and this was the point of view of uh, Donaldson's first paper, in fact, while he was still a student, uh, where he gave a new proof of uh, Narasimhan's Sushadri theorem by using these moment map uh, gauge theoretic uh, techniques. So that, that was uh, something which was in, in the air at the time. Uh, so there's a simple extension of that. Uh, so, in other words, we, we think of this A, this space of uh, D-bar operators, if you like, as a, an infinite dimensional uh, Kähler manifold. If I take the cotangent bundle of that, well, the cotangent bundle of anything is a complex symplectic manifold, but what does it mean in this case? Well, the, what is the cotangent space? So the tangent space is the, the zero one forms, if I write it this way, then the one zero forms are the, are the ones which you pair with these and integrate. So this is, this is the way you see the, the cotangent space. Uh, so what is something in here? It's a, it's a D-bar operator. It's a holomorphic structure on this underlying bundle. And it's uh, some C infinity section of the canonical bundle tensored with the Lie algebra bundle. So it's a set of pairs of a holomorphic structure and a Higgs field. But at the moment, there's, uh, there's no compatibility between the two. This, this is just an infinite dimensional affine space. Uh, and it's flat. And so it's, it's got a flat uh, hyperkähler metric. So what you can do then is to, uh, is to apply the hyperkähler quotient construction. So you, take the, you act on this by the group of gauge transformations and ask yourself, what are the moment maps for omega 1, omega 2, and omega-3. And uh, what happens is that if you, if you put omega, so omega-2 and omega-3, when you put them together as a complex symplectic structure, then that's actually the canonical one on the cotangent bundle. The moment map for that is this d bar of uh, phi. So setting that equal to zero is equivalently saying that phi is a holomorphic section of this, uh, this bundle. And the uh, the setting the moment map for omega 1 equal to 0, well, the moment map turns out to be this. And that's, uh, so that gives you these, these three equations, one complex equation, one real equation. And so the moduli space of solutions acquires a, a hyperkähler metric. So this was a, um, this, you know, for me was, uh, so we had, there was a, a method of turning a handle and getting a hyperkähler metric, which was interesting because we didn't know so many examples of hyperkähler metrics. So uh, the problem then is one of uh, of existence. So here I had I had the equations. I could say that the zero set of these moment maps spaces solutions to these equations. I said I was going to get a new hyperkähler metric, but how did I know that it wasn't completely trivial? So you have to prove, first of all, you have to know that there exist solutions. Um, that's, of course, not so difficult because uh, you can take some very specific solution. So suppose you set uh, the Higgs field phi to be equal to zero. Then you're just saying the equations simply say that the curvature is zero. The curvature of this unitary connection is zero. <laughs> And of course, you can construct uh, flat connections just by taking a representation of the fundamental group into the unitary group. You just take generators of the fundamental group of a surface, AIs and BIs. So you just choose 2G elements in UN, and you just need to satisfy this constraint. So 
so we, knowing that there, is, uh, there exists a solution with, uh, with phi equal to zero, then you can actually uh, use implicit function theorems to say that at least for small phi, uh, there are solutions to these, uh, these Higgs bundle equations. And that's kind of as far as I got when I first gave a talk on this. I thought that I was getting uh, a metric, a hyperkähler metric on some neighborhood of the zero section of the cotangent bundle of the space of flat connections. But pretty soon uh, I realized that, uh, well, talking to Simon Donaldson in particular, that uh, there was some stability condition which, uh, which was involved. So one, one needs to know what, what kind of uh, holomorphic bundles together with Higgs fields actually admit uh, a solution. And the model for this was, uh, was really Donaldson's proof of the narasimhan sachadri theorem, which said that if you have a stable holomorphic bundle, then there exists a flat unitary connection. So one needed a certain uh, notion of stability. And this is, this is what it is. It's so, so your vector bundle, holomorphic vector bundle, together with the Higgs field phi is stable, if and only if for each phi invariant subbundle, the slope, the degree divided by the rank, is smaller than the slope of E. So when phi is equal to zero, that's simply the algebraic geometric definition of stability of, of bundles. So, uh, so the, what one needs, needed to do was to prove that any stable bundle, stable in this sense, stable Higgs bundle, admits uh, a, a Hermitian metric for which these equations hold. So, uh, so I, I gave a, a proof just rank two on a Riemann surface, and Simpson gave a much more general proof for arbitrary rank and with, in higher dimensions. So, but uh, now, now the most important feature, of course, that we've been uh, hearing about the past couple of days has been this uh, the characteristic polynomial of this Higgs field, uh, the base of this, this vibration. So, uh, so maybe it's interesting for, for me to say how, how the characteristic polynomial came into the picture as far as I was concerned. And it really came in because of, uh, of, of the, the existence proof. So, so what is the, so the characteristic polynomial? So you have this Higgs field phi, and you write down the characteristic polynomial, phi is an endomorphism with values in the canonical bundle, so the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial are actually holomorphic sections of various powers of the canonical bundle. And uh, this is a, a useful, uh, I mean, looking at the characteristic polynomial is very useful, in particular in looking at some large set of uh, stable bundles, because if, the, if you have an invariant subbundle, uh, never mind whether its slope is less than uh, uh, less than the slope of the big bundle. Uh, the the characteristic polynomial is divisible by the characteristic polynomial of the restriction to the invariant subbundle. So, uh, for example, if the algebraic curve, which is defined by the vanishing of this, is irreducible, then you automatically know that you've got a you've got a stable bundle. So. It's, it's relatively easy, uh, if you're looking at examples, to actually uh, find, uh, to establish a stability condition, uh, at least in some, in some open set. But anyway, the, the, the point about this in the, in the proof of the theorem that I gave was, was the, the following. So it's, it's that, so the idea in the proof, which is kind of modeled on Donaldson's proof, was this, that you take a, a pair of objects, d bar operator and a phi, on a fixed C infinity bundle, and you transform them by a complex gauge transformation. So when you do that, uh, so you look at the orbit under the action of the group of complex gauge transformations. That's just automorphism, C infinity automorphisms of the bundle. That, of course, acts on the Higgs field by conjugation. And so the characteristic polynomial remains the same. So when, you, when you're looking at that, that orbit, then you have uh, the characteristic polynomial is fixed. So that, that helps you uh, in actually uh, proving the existence. So let, I, don't, I don't want to go into the details here, but, 
So one of the, one of the standard techniques in, uh, in studying gauge theory is, is the Oldenbeck's weak compactness theorem. And so uh, basically what it says in two dimensions is that uh, if you want to find a, a convergent sequence, then you need to find an L2 bound on the, uh, on the curvature. So the idea is to, we want to solve the, the equation F plus phi phi star equals zero. So on this orbit, you look for a, a sequence which minimizes the L2 norm of this. And then you hope that you can get to a point where, where it actually, actually vanishes. So, so what you're starting out with in this is a, a bound. So you have a, a minimizing sequence for this on this orbit. You have a bound for this. But you also know that the characteristic polynomial is fixed. So here there's a standard method. So when you, you, have, you this phi satisfies a, an elliptic equation, d by it's holomorphic. So there's a, a Weizenbach formula. This is like the, uh, these basic early Kodaira vanishing theorems, really, are derived from these Weizenbach formulas. It involves the curvature. But then this phi moves over into the bracket with phi star. You have a bound on this. So f is approximately like minus phi phi star. When you throw that in, you get a bound uh, this way. So that's, that's, from, so that's from the existence of the solution to a differential equation. But now uh, you observe that uh, if you have a, a complex M by M matrix, then we know that if it commutes with its adjoint, then it's a normal matrix. So it can be diagonalized by a unitary matrix. And so and the diagonal entries, of course, are given by the, uh, the characteristic polynomial. So in particular, you know that if, the, if A, say, suppose the norm of A is equal to 1, then you know that the characteristic polynomial and the norm of, the, uh, of, the, the, of A, A star, they can't vanish simultaneously. Okay. So what that means is that if you have bounds on the characteristic polynomial and bounds on this, on this then you get bounds on A. So... Uh, so that means that, uh, so here, I had this bound here before, just from this Weizenbach formula. But now I have bounds on the characteristic polynomial bounds. On, I have this bound. This gives me a bound on phi n. And then uh, put it back into here, and you get a bound on fn, and you get, and you get convergence. So, so that's, that was, in a way, what I was, uh, why I was interested in the characteristic polynomial in the first place. That, uh, so in particular, if I had a sequence now which satisfied the equations, if I have a sequence inside my moduli space, or even before dividing out by the moduli space, if I have a sequence which has a bound on the characteristic polynomial, then, okay, then I get convergence in the moduli space because I have to have transform by gauge transformations. So what that meant was in particular that the, the map from this moduli space to the space of coefficients of the characteristic polynomial is actually proper. So, uh, so this and this was a, this was an important feature, and it, it was at the time it was kind of a bit counterintuitive because, uh, in particular, when it, when you look at the, the nilpotent cone, so if if E was that, if you look at the, in, the fiber over zero, so this is going to be compact, and yet it was kind of curious to think that you could take uh, a Higgs field phi and you could multiply it by ten million and it would still lie inside this, this uh, compact uh, subset. But of course, it's, this is a, a moduli space of equivalence classes, and uh, indeed, this is possible. So, um, so the properness of this characteristic polynomial map for stable bundles, so it's, it's the stable, the stability condition gave me a solution to the equations. Solution to the equations gives you the properness of this map. And that was somehow the... Uh, the the fundamental uh, fact about, uh, about the characteristic polynomial that I was, I was interested in. On the other hand, uh, nowadays it's, uh, it's thought of as being fundamental in the, the so-called Hitchin vibration, or the integrable system. And uh, in fact, so that came a little bit, a little bit later. Uh, and it's, it's rather nice that uh, we're having this, uh, this conference here, this uh, in, uh, in honor of Ngoba Chow here in Canada, because, in fact, the, uh, the Hitchin vibration was born in Canada. So it's, it wasn't born in Toronto, but it was, 
up here in, in Quebec. So this was, uh, I don't know, uh, 1985 or so. And I was, I was visiting my former student, Jacques Ortebis, in Montreal. And uh, we went up to his, his, uh, this, this place here. So he has, his family has a cottage in the, in the Laurentian Mountains. And uh, while he was uh, fixing the windows and, well, whatever you do when you have a cottage in the mountains, I was uh, sitting with a pen and paper and thinking about this proper map and the complex of the symplectic structure and so on. And then I realized that actually what I got was an integrable system. So let me remind you what an integrable system is. So in this case, the point was this. That I have this, this map and this proper map, and if I onto a vector space, uh, so I have this, choosing a basis for the vector space, I have these, say, functions, pi and pj, and they press on commute with respect to the symplectic structure. So it's, it's an integrable system, and the, the generic fiber is a, a complex torus. So, uh, so what, uh, what, what is it? So the picture is that it's related to the Jacobian of the spectral curve, because the spectral curve gives me an equation. So it's an equation which uh, you interpret as lying inside the total space of the cotangent bundle of the Riemann surface. The point here is that uh, phi is an endomorphism twisted with a canonical bundle. So an eigenvalue, x, is actually going to take values in the canonical bundle. So strictly speaking, it's, it's inside k. Uh, another way of saying it is that x is the tautological section of the pullback of the canonical bundle to the total space, then this is a, a this determinant is then a section of some uh, power of that pullback bundle. Anyway, the, the spectral curve is a, an n-fold cover. And uh, so then uh, the point is, what is the, what is the generic fiber? Well, it's, it's kind of related to the eigenspace itself, but, uh, but the construction is basically this, that you take a line bundle on the, on the well, we heard this from Chaudois, but I'll say it again. Uh, you have a line bundle on the spectral curve. Then you take its direct image, and that's a rank n vector bundle on sigma. The direct image is defined this way, that given an, an open set on sigma, you look at the inverse image upstairs, and you look at the holomorphic set. You define the holomorphic sections of the direct image to be this holomorphic sections of the line bundle upstairs. And then, of course, near a regular value, the inverse image is just n copies of a disk. It's obviously an, uh, like looking like the sections of a, a rank n vector bundle. But when you have, say, a ramification like this, it's equally got, this is as a function of the, uh, the, the quotient, it's got the same, same structure. So, so whichever way you look at it, it's, uh, what you get is, a, is a, a vector bundle downstairs. Moreover, if you look at this, uh, this x here, so this tautological section of the pullback of the canonical bundle, then it maps the uh, sections of L on the inverse image to sections of L tends to this on the inverse image, which is like saying that it maps H0OE to H0OE tends to K, and that is the Higgs field. So this, uh, this, this, fi this generic fiber, when the curve is smooth, is uh, for the general linear group here is in fact the um, the Jacobian of the uh, or Picard group of the uh, of the um, uh, the spectral curve. So now, so when when so Jacques and I were talking about this, uh, and when we got back uh, back to his apartment, we we started thinking about what is the simplest possible case. Let's, you know, we have a new integrable system. It's not the Calogero moses system or any other named system that we knew about. And so we thought, what, what is the simplest possible example? So uh, the intercept, so what, well, genus two, rank two, uh, it's well known that the, uh, in the odd, odd degree case, uh, rank two and odd degree, the moduli space of stable bundles is the intersection of two quadrics in P5. And so here we had some kind of uh, functions defined on the cotangent bundle of that, uh, which extend to this, this Higgs bundle of moduli space. But so, uh, and Jack, Jack had written a paper on the intersection of two quadrics, so we, we thought about this a long time, but never got anything uh, out of it. 
And it was much later, in fact, that uh, even the, the even degree case, the case of SL2C in genus 2, was actually uh, written down. And uh, so Van Heyman and Previato uh, wrote one paper, but uh, the, the neatest formulation is by, the, by, this, uh, by Christoph Gavensky and uh, Chang got, I think, one of his students. Uh, so I just because this, we're talking so much about it, uh, about this vibration, I thought it would be useful just to give, uh, to actually write down an example. As far as I know, it's like the only example that you can really, really write down. Uh, Ramanan a few weeks ago told me that uh, that he was looking at the at the intersection of two quadrics, but but anyway, this is this is the this is a, the simpler case. So so we're on a curve of genus two. It's a hyperelliptic curve, so it's a branch covering of the projective line branched over these these six points, and we're going to be looking at uh, uh, so. I'm just going to look at the integrable system as defined on the cotangent bundle of the moduli space of stable bundles. Of course, the Higgs, the actual moduli space of Higgs bundles has some extra pieces to it. But at least you can write down, it's determined the integrable system entirely by what we write down on the cotangent bundle. So what is the moduli space uh, here of uh, stable bundles? Well, uh, this was worked out a long time ago. You have this rank two bundle, and you look at the sub-bundles of degree minus one. So the rank two bundle is stable and has degree zero. So there are no, all the sub bundles have to have negative degree, but it turns out that uh, you look at, if you look at the ones of degree minus one, then they trace out uh, a divisor on the uh, Jacobian of or the precard variety of line bundles of degree one. It's a two theta divisor. So the, and the, the moduli space turns out to be just the projective space of this, uh, of this vector space. So it's just a, it's just a, a three-dimensional projective space. Inside it, I mean, the stable bundles actually form the complement of the, the Kuma surface inside there, but uh, that's not so relevant uh, for what we're going to say. So how do you describe explicitly the cotangent bundle of a projective space? Well, there's a nice way of doing that. If you take the product, if you take the, we're under, trying to understand the projective space of a vector space V, then uh, you look at V cross V dual, and you look at the pairs P and Q, such that P is not equal to zero, and this is equal to zero. So there's a the projection onto P is a projection onto P of V. <laughs> so you can parameterize the, uh, this cotangent uh, bundle by these uh, set of pairs like this, P and Q. And uh, this is what uh, this is the form in which Gavensky and his collaborator actually wrote down the integral system. So, so H here is a, a function of P and Q. So it's a function on the cotangent bundle. And uh, what does it take values in? So this is a this is a quadratic differential. So it's a section of the square of the canonical bundle of the hyperelliptic curve. Uh, if you put everything over the denominator, the product of these six factors, then, in fact, you get a linear factor on the top. And that's, that's basically what the uh, quadratic differentials on a curve of genus 2 look like. And what is this sigma ij? Well, there's this action of this uh, finite group, just tensoring the vector bundle E by line bundle of order 2. And that gives you a, there's an action of a, what is it, a finite Heisenberg group on the actual uh, sections here, and uh, given a pair, a pair of uh, a ramification points here, the difference is an element of order two, and that's what that sigma ij is there. And the square means that it's, it's actually, uh, you don't need that central extension. So, so that is actually, uh, uh, as far as I know, the only way of writing down uh, any way that anybody's strictly written down on. But in some sense, that's, you know, the good feature about this integrable system is precisely because you can't write things down explicitly. I mean, it has, it has a degree of generality, which clearly means that it can be exported into, into other areas quite, uh, quite well, in particular, in the way that uh, Ngo has shown. Okay, so, so that's, uh, but that's focusing on the... Uh, on, in fact, one complex structure in this uh, hyperkähler family. So 
the complex structure which I call I is the Higgs bundle complex structure. But as I said, <coughs> this moduli space has a, a hypercalar structure, and so one needs to understand also the other complex structures, the I, the J, and the K. So, uh, so what happens? So we have the, now the complex structure I. So here's, this is just the defining notation, really. So there's a, it's a, a, a holomorphic symplectic manifold, which uh, I'm going to call So omega 2 plus I omega 3 is this holomorphic symplectic form there. And then what about the complex structure J? So this is the one where the Kähler form is the real part of the holomorphic symplectic form of the first one. And the symplectic form, the complex symplectic form, is given by this. So this is a, this is a different complex structure. And in fact, uh, it's uh, an inequivalent one. So what happens is this, that you, you have uh, what are, what the Higgs bundle equations give us a unitary connection and a Higgs field phi. If you put these together, uh, then this actually, this vanishes. Okay, this bracket vanishes. The phi is holomorphic. And then the bracket of D with D bar is the curvature. And so what you get this way is a, is a flat uh, GLNC connection. In other words, this is a flat UN connection. This is, not, sorry, non-flat UN connection. This is a UN connection. But this now is, is not in, this is symmetric rather than skewer. It's self-adjoint rather than skewer-joint. And so this, uh, this takes values in the full, the algebra of GLNC rather than in UN. So there is a map when you, so basically you, Look at these solutions, and you look at them in this light, and what you find is that this is the complex structure J. So, in other words, the <coughs> there is a map from this moduli space to the space of equivalence classes of flat GLNC connections, and that uh, that map is actually a, an isomorphism. If you look at uh, reductive representations, well, on the stable points, it's irreducible representations. So this, uh, this hypercalar manifold, this hypercalar moduli space, has this uh, family of complex structures. I is the moduli space of Higgs bundles. This is where you get the vibration structure. J is the space of moduli space of representations into, into the complex, complex group. Uh, okay, and now, I, I, I mean, I've talked about J, but actually J and K are more or less the same because you can always... Uh, multiply the Higgs field by e to the i theta and still get a, a solution to the equations. And so the roles of J and K and any linear combination of them can actually be uh, interchanged. So K has the same uh, complex structure, equivalent complex structure. So, um, so in the last five minutes, I just want to uh, talk about uh, this question of can these complex structures talk to each other? I mean, they exist only by solving this nonlinear differential equation. I mean, they, they exist on the same space because of uh, this solution to this nonlinear gauge theoretic equation. But is there some way in which they, they know about each other's existence? Are there features of uh, the complex structure I which are recognizable in the complex structure J? Well, one way of looking at this, one exam example, is, is to think of some involution. So suppose, here's one, one case. Suppose you're interested in the space of representations into a real group, GLNR. So that's, that's a real form of GLNC. Uh, but we can represent uh, flat connections with uh, GLNC by a unitary connection in the Higgs field. So it turns out that if you want a GLNR connection, then uh, what you want here is a, an orthogonal connection. You basically look at the maximal compact subgroup of the real form, and then <coughs> your connection takes values in the maximal compact subgroup. So this is now an orthogonal connection, and the Higgs field takes values in the opposite. So rather than being a skewer joint, it's, it's self adjoint. Um, but from the point of view of the uh, uh, of this uh, complex structure, then so this is complex structure J. Then these are this is these are the real points of the uh, of an involution of an anti-holomorphic involution with respect to J. On the other hand, uh, in terms of the complex structure I, 
This is a holomorphic involution. So we, we look at the involution on the moduli space, which takes a, a vector bundle to its dual. And once you've got an, an isomorphism between E and its dual, you want phi to be equal to its, its, its transpose. So the point about this is that the, the complex structure I, has the, this involution is holomorphic, whereas it's anti-holomorphic in the complex structure J. So if you, if you want to know something about the moduli space of representations into GLNR, you can learn something by looking at the fixed points of this involution and the complex structure I. So this, if you like, is so if I look at I, J, and K, this particular involution is doing this to the, to the complex structures. Now, uh, replacing phi by its transpose uh, doesn't do anything to the characteristic polynomial. And so the, the involution in the Higgs bundle picture acts trivially on the base of the vibration. So it acts on each fiber, and it depends how you normalize these things, but effectively the fixed points of this are given by the two torsion points in the, so in a generic fiber, which is this Jacobian, you've got the two torsion points in the generic fiber. So this, so generically, uh, away from the discriminant locus, so what we have is this moduli space of flat GLNR connections is actually a, a covering space. Um, so, but there's an obvious uh, fixed point here, that is uh, where the line bundle is trivial. So you ask yourself the question, okay, let's take that. So suppose we, we push down the trivial bundle. So F, suppose L is trivial here. Push it down and the direct image uh, bundle is actually the sum of line bundles, the sum of powers of the canonical bundle. And the Higgs field uh, has a canonical form. Well, it is the canonical form, uh, well, it's the companion matrix standard canonical form, given the characteristic polynomial, you can write down a matrix which has that characteristic polynomial, which is the, the companion matrix. So what that does is actually to give you a section of this, uh, this vibration. So it says that inside this moduli space here, there is, in fact, a component of the fixed point set of that involution, which is a copy of a vector space, namely this, this base here. So... When you go back, you say, well, uh, what does that mean? In the complex structure J, what you find is a connected, contractible component of the space of equivalence classes of uh, homomorphisms into GLNR. So you learn something. You learn that there is a special component inside this uh, space of flat GLNR connections, uh, which is uh, homeomorphic to a Euclidean space. And this is a, this is a higher Teichmuller space. So when n is equal to 2, or maybe for SL2, then this is, this is basically Teichmuller space. The representations into SL2R, which uniformize a surface, uh, form the, the corresponding space here. So in this sense, the, uh, the, the we learn something about representations into a, a real group by looking at involutions on the, uh, the Higgs bundle side. There's one final way. Uh, so now you can look at, uh, look at another involution. Suppose you have a real algebraic curve. So now suppose the, the curve itself, the uh, Riemann surface, has a, an anti-holomorphic involution. Then what this will do is, uh, so all you're doing here as far as the fundamental group is concerned is, if you like, you're changing the generators. This is a, a geometrical action on, uh, on sigma. So this gives a, a holomorphic involution with respect to the complex structure J. Right? So it's a holomorphic involution on the space of representations into GLNC. And the fixed point set of this is a, a, a complex, in fact, a complex Lagrangian sub, sub variety. So this, uh, this is, uh, so this, this real algebraic curve is oriented, so the anti holomorphic involution is orientation reversing. And what it does is, is this. So it actually gives you a, an anti-holomorphic involution on the complex structure I of, of Higgs bundles. So what does that mean? Well, uh, so now the, uh, the real structure induces a real structure on these sections of the canonical bundle, powers of the canonical bundle. And so when you look at the vibration, you, uh, you have a, a real slice of this. You have a, a real vector space in the in the uh, the base of the vibration, and then you have real tori 
in the, in the generic fibers. So, so this complex Lagrangian submanifold inside the space of representations actually has the structure of a, of an, a real integrable system. So these are two types of, uh, uh, of involutions where, in some sense, the, the structure of the complex structure of one tells you something about some information about sub-varieties of the other. In this particular case, uh, so these are actually what are called special Lagrangian submanifolds. But in this case, actually, this fits into another, another picture that whenever you have a, a three-manifold whose boundary is the surface, then there's a, a Lagrangian submanifold in the space of uh, representations just by looking at those representations which extend to the interior, representations of sigma which extend to this, this three-manifold interior. And in fact, uh, with this, uh, when you have a real structure, uh, there's a, you can define a natural three-manifold whose uh, boundary is the is this given surface. So you, you simply take the product with the, the interval minus one, one, you look at the involution changing the sign on this, and then, well, if, if, the, if, tor, if there are no real points, if tor has no fixed points, then this is just a, a, a covering. Uh, when tor has uh, fixed points, uh, then the fixed points are given by zero here, and the fixed points there, so that's a co-dimension two. So it's a curve, uh, so a collection of curves inside this three-manifold, and when you quotient by an involution, that's again a smooth manifold. It's a branch covering, co-dimension two. So actually, you, these, these are examples of uh, Lagrangian submanifolds inside the space of uh, flat connections, which come from, uh, well, components of them uh, come from, uh, from this, this, this construction. Well, as uh, so, well, my time's up. So here I was trying to tell you that, uh, about how the, the two complex structures may or may not talk to each other. But this is, this is if you like, in, in the classical language. And I think perhaps in the, this afternoon's talks, you may hear how perhaps in the quantum world, uh, these complex structures talk to each other uh, rather more freely. And uh, also in uh, Tamasha's talk, that you'll see that in characteristic P, the, uh, there are uh, relations which one can see between these two complex structures also. But my time's up, and I better stop there. So thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, well, well, it depends what you call interesting, I suppose. Uh, um, I don't know. It's, it's, just, uh, it's just this is an observation, if you like, that uh, that an involution gives you an interior to the to the surface in this canonical way. Um, so, I mean, as we know, the, it's a very complicated question about determining the distribution of ovals in a, a real algebraic curve. It's one of Hilbert's uh, problems: uh, which ones are inside the others, and so. If I just talk about a real curve, then, uh, then of course, the, uh, yeah, there are all sorts of questions about, about the real points. But, uh, <clears throat> but it's, I mean, in a sense, this is just an observation. It's fitting these fixed points of this type of involution into a bigger picture, which is looking at representations which extend to a three-manifold. I, I have one question. Uh, I mean, you take uh, always uh, the canonical divisor. So, and uh, Ngo Baochao is using uh, not the canonical divisor, but an arbitrary divisor. Yes. And then you have much more flexibility in particular. You have many examples which are elementary to, to describe when uh, the curve is a projective line, for yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, are there in a interest in mathematics? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, I mean, in particular, you could look at uh, parabolic Higgs bundles on the projective line. And it is true that some classical integrable systems can be realized in, in this so, way. I mean, uh, because, they're, because then, you, I mean, the simplest one is, you know, taking rank two with uh, four points on the projective line, mm -hmm. then you get a, an elliptic surface as the, mm -hmm. as the, uh, the Higgs bundle moduli space. Uh, 
So, so perhaps you know, when I was saying that it's very difficult to write down these integrable systems, then in the purely smooth case, uh, in other words, where the, the Higgs field really does take values in the canonical bundle and not in the canonical bundle, or, I mean, depends how you think about it. I mean, you can think about it as a, a Higgs bundle, a Higgs field which has poles, has simple poles, mm -hmm. uh, when you do the twist. And if you think of it that way, then then indeed there are yes there are moduli spaces whose integrable system can be can be can be written down much better. That, that is true. Oh, very nice. So let's thank the speaker again. And, uh...